anesthesia for total joint replacement surgeries. There are a couple of options um, to successfully do this from an anesthetic standpoint. The first option would be a general anesthetic in which we use drugs through your IV and also through your breathing tube inhaled drugs to keep you asleep, unaware, and as pain-free as possible throughout the entire procedure. What does a general anesthetic entail? Some of you may not have had one in the past. That means we're going to get you back to the operating room. We're going to hook up all our fancy monitors like a heart monitor, blood pressure cuff, oxygen monitor, things like that, and then give you pure oxygen to breathe through a mask. After you do that for about a minute, we'll start giving you medicine through your IV, and one of those medicines will send you all the way off to sleep. After you're asleep, you don't care what we're doing because you're sleeping. That's when we put the breathing tube in. Now, that thing should be out before you wake up, too. In the vast majority of the cases, that's true. So you shouldn't remember that at all. Once it's in place, though, we're going to give you anesthetic gas through it to keep you asleep, oxygen because your body really likes that stuff, give you some pain medicine through your IV, some anti-nausea stuff, antibiotics, and whatever else we think you may need to get you through this safely. Now, risk-wise for the general anesthetic, um, most common thing is just sore throat from the breathing tube. It can feel dry, hoarse for a couple days, but it gets better. That's pretty minor in the grand scheme of things. Less common things would be nausea. There's always a small chance of nausea from the anesthetic itself and also the pain medicine we have to give you through your IV during the case. We would treat that while you were asleep, though, and have more stuff available in the recovery room if you needed it. Um, other things are exceedingly rare. We're talking about things like finding a new drug allergy, which we would have everything in the room to treat on hand immediately if needed. Vocal cord damage from a breathing tube, which is exceedingly rare, um, but it could leave somebody permanently hoarse. Risk of things like pneumonias developing from having a breathing tube in place. Kidney complications, which are actually um, higher in certain patient populations that have pre-existing kidney injuries. Finally, there are the extremely rare complications that could occur from general anesthesia, things like heart attack, stroke, or death from it. In a healthy medically managed patient population, though, those things are just exceedingly rare. But I want to stress how important it is for you to make sure your health is optimized and you're in the best shape you possibly can be before you pursue any elective surgery. The second option is actually a spinal anesthetic. And many studies have shown that this is the, actually the superior method to use for these type of joint replacement surgeries. The reason for this um, are actually multiple. First of all, it decreases your overall risk of lung complications after the surgery. It decreases your risk of kidney complications after the surgery. Um, there may be less bleeding during the surgery, less chance of blood clots forming in your legs after the surgery, and also, maybe just as if, if not more important, overall better pain satisfaction from a pain control standpoint with the spinal versus the general anesthetic. Um, in addition to that, many studies also show an overall decreased length of stay at the hospital if you choose a, 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 a spinal versus the general. A lot of people also want to know what are the potential complications or risks associated with spinal anesthesia. And luckily, most are either extremely benign or very, very, very rare. First of all, the common thing would be a little bruising in the area. Like a bruise anywhere else, you give it a few days, it gets better. Um, less common things, extremely rare things actually, um, would be a spinal headache. And the studies show that those range anywhere from 1% to way less than that. We're talking less than half a percent based on age. The older you get, more experienced in life you are, the less risk you are at having that develop. And there are things we can do to actually treat those and get those much better the vast, vast majority of the time if that were to occur. Let's talk a little bit about how we actually do a spinal block. What that entails is we'll get you to the operating room the day of your surgery and we will give you a little cocktail and a syringe to let you relax, a little medicine to take the edge off for you because a lot of people are nervous about you know, a needle going in their back and that's very understandable. Um, but we'll sit you on the operating bed, position you the way we need you with your head down to your chest. You'll slouch your shoulders and kind of roll your back out towards us. If you think of a mad cat getting angry, that's kind of what we want there. Um, after you're in that position, we'll assess where exactly we want to go on your spine clean it off, sterilize the area with sterilizing solution, put a sterile drape on you. Then we'll take some numbing medicine there and numb it up. That feels like a hornet sting though, and that's usually the worst pain or discomfort people have during this entire thing. So if you've ever had another procedure like dental work where they use that sort of thing, you kind of know what to expect. It's gonna sting and burn for a second, and then it's gonna be numb. 
Then what we do is we take our spinal needle, which is a longer needle, but it's a very thin, tiny needle, and we go directly into your spinal sac with that and inject, you know, half a teaspoon to a teaspoon of medication in there that will get you numb, like I said, above your belly button for the duration of the case. 